questions. Let's go ahead and get started about powertrain. If you haven't figured it out, gentlemen, so far everything that we've talked about has redundancy after redundancy after redundancy. This is it. There's no redundancy for this system, which means we need to be paying close attention. And see, we kind of have a problem that we have to be aware of. And that problem is most of you have only climbed up on top once. A few of you might have got a second time. And most unheard of, unless you show a weakness, will get a third time. Which means that we kind of set a precedence that we have to be careful of. And that precedence is, well, because they don't take me up top and train me specifically on the top, except for introducing me to pieces and parts, and that's pretty much all that happened, right? This is the rotor head, this is the blade, this is the, the basic stuff, right? These are the drive train, this is the drive train. And so what we've done is we've kind of set up a, well, it's not that important because they're not teaching me. They're not spending more time with me on that. Well, that mentality goes out to the field. And so that's why I take advantage of this class. I want to nip that mentality in the bud. Just so everybody understands, because your time is so limited here, you're not doing a pre-flight. Let's make no beefs about that. You are not pre-flighting this aircraft. You are not doing any shape, form, or fashion of a pre-flight. All you're doing on these aircrafts is training. The daily is accomplished by the civilians here at Mother Wrecker. The pre-flight is actually accomplished by your crew member. That's what's going on, just so you understand. The top is so doggone important that they put that crew member up on top to pre-flight the top. <coughs> now, I kind of bring this up and I'm noticing that people are starting to taper off. But how many people have always heard that the CH-47 is the only aircraft that can have a mid-air with itself? Anybody? Okay, one. That went away after the C-Box upgrade, right? Exactly, but a lot of people don't know that and they still like to talk crap about the CH-47 in reference to that. Okay, what we used to have associated with this combining transmission right here and the combining transmission takes the power of both engines, reduces it and change angles and sends it forward and aft. What we used to have on that combining transmission is a wonderful thing called a phasing handle, which is another term that gets you you've referred to. And a lot of people secretly in their head are saying, what in the hell do you mean phasing? What's phasing? Phasing is where we make one blade go between two. And that's what keeps happening one blade between two, and that's how it's alternating. That's really how those blades don't hit each other. Everybody says, well, one flies higher than the other. Well, we're going to nip all these myths in the butt today. That's what we're going to do, OK? By phasing the rotor system, we make one blade fly between two. That's what we're doing. Now, to help us with that, what we used to have on this combining transmission was a phasing handle that was located on the right side right here. Literally, you pushed it in towards the transmission, towards the drive shaft, and then you pushed it down. Okay? Now, there was a possibility of it accidentally falling down. But in, even then, when we safety wired it and protected it and made sure that it stayed up, there was still another problem with the C-Box. And that was that that system created a weakness within the combining transmission. So even when we stopped the handle from vibrating and falling down, the next problem we had was that it created a weakness within the combining transmission. And that's what would cause the combining transmission to fail. And that's what would cause the desynchronizing of the blades. And that's where that rumor or that, even then, it wasn't that bad. You know, just so you make no beefs about it. It wasn't that bad. Okay, so why do we make a big deal about it if we've changed the combining transmission? One, because this aircraft can still have a mid-air with itself, only if we don't do our job right. Okay, and we have a bad habit of not looking at these drive shafts the way we should. To the tune of, and I make no beats about it. When I was a crew member, the top was my pet peeve. 
Why? Because I knew the top was going to kill me faster than anything else. So, but I was so anal about it. If I saw you pre-flight the top and I noticed that you did not look at it like you were supposed to, I don't care who you were or what you were, I'd come over and address the problem. And how did I address the problem? First off, what were people doing wrong? They have a habit of climbing up on top, and this is what they do. Yep, OK, everything's good. If I saw anybody do that, what I did is I would sneak up on top of the aircraft, and I would take a pen or a pencil, and I would slide it up on the shaft. If they were junior to me, I told them to relook at the drive shaft area. If they were senior to me, I cordially invited them to look at it. To the tune of, they knew that I did something. And you want to hear a scary statistic? Seven out of 10 still would not find the pen. Why did I use a pen or a pencil? Because with these flight suits, if you've never seen it, okay, because those red and red slash pencil combinations were bigger than a normal pen pencil, what people would do is cut these things off. Remember that? Some of you old timers, they would cut them off. Okay, you want, you want to know what the latest and greatest craze is now? They take them, they twist them around, they put one pen on one side, one pencil on the other side, and then they stick them together like that. Kind of defeating the whole purpose of having these flaps on there. Okay, those flaps are to help keep those pens and pencils where they belong. So that's why I always use pens and pencils, because it was reality. Okay, now I'm not going to sit here and tell you that pens and pencils was the only things we found under there. We found wrenches, we found knives, we found bolts, we found sockets of all kinds, screwdrivers of all kinds. The struts have a pin that you have to pull and it collapses the struts. Sometimes that ring that you pull would come loose and get up under there. Most of your debris that you find on your safety boards, a lot of it comes from there. And then yes, a good portion of it comes from the flight line, doing flight line walks and stuff like that. But a lot of it's from that drive shafting area. The only proper way to inspect the drive shaft area and this is why people don't like to do it. This aircraft's hot in the summer. It's cold in the winter. Okay? But the only way is to get on your hands and knees and run your hands up under there. That's the only way you're going to find this stuff. Now, how many people have seen the picture of the Pepsi can alongside of the drive shaft? That happened right here at Mother Rucker. That happened right here at Mother Rucker. Okay. What happened was the aircraft did its routine thing. It was scheduled for AMs. Aircraft one, two, three, what's the status of your aircraft? We're up. Good. It's going back out. Okay. So what happens? Now technically, legally, not advisable, but legally, the daily and the pre-flight's already accomplished. So legally, you could just climb up into the cockpit and go fly that aircraft. Luckily enough, the crew member was as anal about the top as I am and wanted to at least look at the drivetrain tunnel cover area. And that's when they found that Pepsi can. Had it flown another four hours, it may or may not have come back. Okay? That's how sometimes lackadaisical we get about the top. Where was the Pepsi can? How did it get into the, the drive shaft? Area? Don't know. I'm not going to sit here and speculate. All I know is it happened right here, and all I know is that it was found getting ready to go fly that aircraft again. Okay, I'm not. It was just laying right there, and there's a picture of it down at the flight line on the safety board. Okay, not a very flattering advertisement, but there it is. Okay, and that's why we have to look at the top very good. That's why the importance of the drivetrain. And when I teach this, you'll see, you know, yeah, I get excited about all my class, but I'm a little bit more particular about this one because if you don't do your job right on this one, if you don't understand what's going on, it's easy to make a lot of mistakes in this area. And you can't afford them. 
Any questions about that? Okay, there's one more problem, but we'll address it when we get to it in the, in the handout. Terminal learning objective. Action, describe components, operational characteristics, functions, limitations, and emergency procedures of the CH-47D drivetrain. Conditions, in a classroom given a CH-47D engine transmission cutaway and a student handout. Standards, correctly answer in writing without reference. Seven of nine questions pertaining to the components, operational characteristics, limitations, functions, and emergency procedures of the CH-47D powertrain system in accordance with TM 1-152040-10 and your student handout. Safety requirements, none. Risk assessment, low. Environmental considerations, none. Evaluation, each student will be evaluated on this block of instructions during the first written examination. This will be a criterion type examination requiring a go on each scorable unit. You will have 90 minutes for the exam and by now Everybody's very familiar with how we do our exams. Talking about the drivetrain. As we talk about the drivetrain, we're going to look at all the major components. Forward transmissions, seven drive shafts between the forward and the combining transmission. The combining transmission itself, we'll, we'll talk about all the names that it goes by and everything that you need to know about it. Two shafts between the combining transmission and the aft transmission, and then the aft vertical shaft. We're going to nip a lot of confusions in the bud on the aft vertical shaft. There's a lot of confusions with the aft vertical shaft because it is a shaft by definition. It doesn't change. It always is going to be a shaft. But you're going to find out that we put it into a grouping with transmissions. Why? Why do we take a shaft and put it into a grouping with transmissions? There's an uh, oil supply for it. There's an oil supply for it. Okay, what else? Uh, I'd probably say you can't, <coughs> you can't turn it without a transmission. Okay, what else? What else? What type of indications do you get? In reference to that aft vertical shaft problems, only get, only get you get transmissions. You only get two, okay? But they're associated with what lights? Transmission lights, and that's where the confusion comes in. You know, people want to call it a transmission or a transmission-like system, okay? But the bottom line is, it is still a shaft. By every definition of the word shaft, it's a shaft. But because the indications you get up in the cockpit are associated with transmissions, that's why it gets grouped that way. And we'll make sure we understand those as we go along. And then, of course, your two engine transmissions and your engine drive shaft. Starting off with the forward transmission. Big thing about the forward transmission that we have to keep in mind is that it is mounted, tilted. In what direction? Forward. Forward and how far? Nine degrees. Nine degrees. Okay. For what purpose? Why is it tilted? What's the purpose of that transmission being mounted in there tilted? Ground handling, ground taxing of this aircraft? Keep in mind. Gentlemen, that's going to be one of your favorite words. They're going to ask you a lot of times about the tilt and the LCTs. Okay, and we've already covered those. What is the purpose of the 9 degree and 4 degree tilt of the transmissions, the forward transmission and the aft transmission? To aid in ground handling, ground taxing of this aircraft. Keeping in mind, why? Let's use it as a rehash. Why do we have to have the transmissions Tilted. What do you normally do? Move the cyclic forward. forward. But in this aircraft, what does that create in our rotor system? Press. What? Press. Press Not what I'm looking for. Differential collective pitch. 
Meaning what? Meaning when I put in forward cyclic, my forward blades collectively and evenly decrease, my aft rotor blades collectively and evenly increasing, pushing down on my nose, pulling up on my tail. Not very good on an aircraft that's already sitting on the ground. Agreed? So they had to do something based on the tandem rotor system de design and that's where the transmissions are pre-tilted for the ground taxing, ground handling of this aircraft. Any questions about that? Okay. And we're also going to talk about the fact that all these transmissions, the main transmissions are all self-contained, meaning what? Meaning every piece and part associated with them is mounted directly to them. Now, I don't know of any other way to kind of get you to appreciate that except for telling you that in the Charlie models and below, airflow was created. In Charlie models and below, airflow on that aircraft was created. On the D model and above, we manage airflow. We don't create it. What's the big difference? The big difference was the aft pylon on Charlie models and below was nothing more than a huge fan driven off of a shaft off the aft transmission for the purpose of what? Creating air. For the purpose of what? All our oil coolers were mounted into that area so that that airflow would be blown into the coolers. But now all the transmissions are self-contained. So now what we have to do is ensure that that airflow, based on its entry points, gets to the associated place. And we're going to show you how all that's accomplished today. Okay? Why? What benefit came from that? Well, if all the coolers were back in the aft pylon, what did we have to do? We had to run oil lines from the front of the aircraft to the back, from the back to the front, from the top to the bottom, from the bottom to the top, from the left to the right, from the right to the left. That's a whole lot of oil lines. To the point we used to have a standard joke. When we were training new pilots or new crew members, we would point to the window and say, sir, ma'am, new crew member, what are those? <laughs> they'd laugh at you and they'd say, come on, I'm not that stupid. Those are windows. No, those were our old sight glasses. If they were not covered with oil, you didn't want to be on that airplane because there's only one thing that would account for that. And that was insufficient lubrication. Not a very good thing with all these moving parts and everything. Okay, that's how bad it leaked. Why? Because we had lines running all over the place. And all you have to do to verify exactly what I'm saying, go look at that alpha model in the museum. Just in the transmission area alone, look at the change. You walk into the D model aft transmission area and it's pretty well self-explanatory and you can see all the pieces and parts. Now go do the same thing in the A model and go say, yep, under all those lines there's the transmission. What's that thing? You know, you got so many lines running all over the place. Being able to identify pieces and parts is just hard enough just based on the, all the lines that you had running around it. And they did the same thing by modulizing the hydraulic system, which is why we were able to reduce leak points there. Combining transmission. One of your real workhorses. Why? Because it's going to take the power from both engines via their engine transmission. It's going to reduce it and change angles. Let's make sure that everybody understands. A transmission a transmission a transmission. What is the job of a transmission? All transmissions reduce. All transmissions change <coughs> angles. Okay, that's what happens in transmissions and this, these transmissions are no exceptions. They're all going to re be reduced and they're all going to change angles and we'll re-emphasize that here in just a second. And then of course the aft transmission which we already said was mounted tilted forward. It's mounted tilted forward for the purpose of ground handling, ground taxiing and again all you have to do is look at this picture 
Then go look at that alpha model in the museum and you can see the reduction in the lines that were running all over this aircraft. Reduce the amount of lines, you reduce the amount of leak points. The aft transmission is going to receive power from the combining transmission via the 8 and 9 drive shaft and it's going to drive your aft vertical shaft which is going to result in driving the aft rotor system. Your engine transmissions are mounted at the front of each one of your power plants, your engines. And keep in mind, this is the difference between a thrust producing engine and a transmission driven or the engine driving a transmission. Okay. Remember we have the power turbine wheels and we took you through the engine to the output shaft. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take you from the engine transmissions through the rest of the drivetrain. We already talked power plant, so we're not going to reteach power plant. And the drive shaft and the synchronizing shafts. Okay? One of my pet peeves. Why? On the bottom of page four, you will notice that if you look on your student handout, those shafts are turning in excess of what? Somebody want to read that out loud? 6,912 6, rounds per minute. That's fast. Now, I'm going to add one more thing. Remember when I was talking about finding things underneath these shafts? That's what you're dealing with, gentlemen. That's how thick they are. At 6,912 rounds per minute, how long do you think it would take a nut or a bolt or a pen or a pencil or any type of metal object to cut through these things? Not very long. Okay? So that's why I've always been touchy about the top of this aircraft. Now, one other thing that I'm going to point out and take advantage of this picture. See this baffle right here? This baffle was an afterthought. Okay, it actually came on a acceptance test flight from Boeing. Senior Army aviator on board, senior Boeing test pilot on board. Completely survivable incident resulted in three dead and a total loss of the aircraft. Why? In talking about the fuel, excuse me, the air management, what you're going to find out is all the airflow is going to result up in the front of this aircraft, up in the cabin, up in the cockpit. Okay? Why is that important? Because in chapter 9, under fires, you have an underlying step that's very, very important that a lot of people don't grasp the importance of that underlying step. Why? Because it's in blurbage. It's not what you're used to. Here's the EP. Here's the underlying step. You got this big old blurb, and in the middle there, down towards the bottom, you have this underlying step in big bold letters, right? And rightfully so. Anybody know what blurb I'm talking about? Cockpit windows closed. Cockpit windows closed, air control knobs in. The purpose of that is to slow down, note the key word, slow down that process. It doesn't stop it. But what had happened on that aircraft is the smoke and fumes had actually made their way down the tunnel cover area and got into the cockpit before anybody realized it. Incapacitated the pilots and there's why the aircraft went down. So this baffle was an afterthought. This was added later to help facilitate in the slowing down process. You can't stop what you don't know is occurring, and that's why they added that baffle in there. So that's what you're looking at in there. Now we have seven shafts in front of the combining transmission, between the forward transmission and the combining transmission, and then you have two shafts between the combining transmission and the aft transmission for a grand total of nine shafts, two engine drive shafts for a total of 11, and then the aft vertical shaft is a vertical shaft. It's a shaft for 12. Okay. 
Now, this is one of my favorite pictures. How many people have heard the rumor that one engine drives one rotor system, the other engine drives the other rotor system? How many people have ever heard that one? Surprisingly enough, a lot of people, when they first see the CH-47, that's what they imagine is going on. Okay? And really, until they get around it, and I'm the first one to admit, that's what I thought. When I first saw this big old Chinook, that's what I thought. It made sense to me, two rotors, two engines. But by now, you all know that that's not true. Each one of those engines, yeah, come on bus, I know. Each one of those engines is driving an engine transmission, which is going down to the combining transmission, and that power is going to be combined and then set forward and aft. If you look at these, this picture, we'll get the video going, and you can actually see it turning. But the big thing about it is, is this is a nice reference slide. Why is it a nice reference slide? Because everything you ever wanted to know and more is on this slide. Okay, each one of the engines is producing 15,066 shaft, or excuse me, rounds per minute. That's going to result up at 225 rounds per minute up at the rotor system. Why? Because what's going to happen is the first, the transmission, the engine transmissions, going to reduce it, and you can see it up here, 1 23rd to 1 ratio and each one of those is going to reduce it. Then the combining transmission is going to reduce it from 177 to 1 ratio. And then it's going to go forward and aft and there's that 6,912 rounds per minute. Nice number to know. Why? It just helps you appreciate what's going on up there. And then each one of those transmissions is going to continue. The forward transmission is going to reduce it at 3070 30, 70 seconds to 1, and the aft transmission is going to have to reduce it the same amount because it's coming out of the combining transmission the same, and then up to the rotor where it's going to be producing 225 rounds per minute. Any questions about that? The following transmissions have both a main and an aux lubrication system. The following transmissions have both a main and an aux lubrication system. The forward transmission, the combining transmission, and the aft transmission. But now, what you're going to notice, and watch this. You all have passed your EPs and limits tests now, right? You're actually flying the aircraft. Here you go. You ready? What is the emergency procedure? If I get the oil pressure light, main oil pressure light, and it's associated with the combining transmission. So that normal or not? What? You gotta know if they have abnormal indications or not. Okay. No normal, any unusual or abnormal indications other than that. Why are we all drawing a blank? Because there's no underlying steps. That's why we're all drawing a blank. Why is there no underlying steps? Because the combining transmission has a main lubrication system as well as an aux lubrication system. But both the main and the aux lubrication systems are both lubricating the same thing. They're lubricating the same gears. So that's why it's a completely redundant system. That's why we have no underlying steps. Okay, now here we go. You ready? What if it's the aft transmission? What if it's the aft transmission? Now what's the procedure? Land. It's land as soon as possible. Anybody else? Okay, good. Since we're on video, I'm not going to let you hang yourself. Most people get the emergency procedure for the oil pressure and the oil temperature confused. Why? Because they, they get in that mindset that there's something different about the aft transmission, and so they always want to bring in that electrical load reduced. 
Okay, and normally I get them hook, line, and sinker, but I'm not going to give you enough sufficient time to start second guessing. Land as soon as possible is the correct answer. But wait a minute now. Didn't we say the aft transmission has a redundant lubrication system too? So why am I landing as soon as possible? The aft transmission does have a redundant lubrication system. So what's the catch? The catch is it's a redundant system strictly for the aft transmission. But the main lubrication system isn't just lubricating the aft transmission, is it, gentlemen? Aft shaft. Aft shaft. What else? I gave you a clue. The generators. The generators. The aux lubrication system of that aft transmission does not pick up a redundancy for those two components, which is why the emergency procedures land as soon as possible. Although the aft transmission is redundantly being lubed, the generators and the aft vertical shaft are not being redundantly lubed, which is why you're landing as soon as possible. Any questions about that? Can you repeat the main and knock for which component? The forward transmission, the combining transmission, and the aft transmission all have a main and an aux lubrication system. The following components only have a main lubrication system. But you'll notice how many transmissions are up in that picture? Only the one. Okay, being two. But the engine transmissions, so what are the other two? Your generators and your aft vertical shaft. Okay? But they have main lubrication systems. Why is that going to be, become important? Because in a little bit we're going to look at the maintenance panel, we're going to look at the master caution panel, and we're going to talk about some emergency procedures. And we're going to really put on our thinking caps then. Now, oil cooler wise, oil coolers. Forward transmission, we said, has its own oil cooler. Combining transmission has its own oil cooler. And aft transmission has its own oil cooler. Right? We've all seen them by now. And actually, the combining transmission's right there. Forward transmission's right there. Aft transmission cooler's right there. That's where all your individual coolers are. But you'll notice the combining transmission also has your cooler for your engine transmission. What do you think those instructor pilots like to ask? Which one's which? Which one's which? And here's the tendency. The tendency is to start with the top one. What's the top end uh, cooler? Whoa. Okay. Number two. What's the tendency? Top and bottom rule, right? Should be the number one, shouldn't it? Wrong. It's actually a backward system if you do it that way. What if I could tell you a way that you can get it right 10 out of 10 times? Would you like that? Would that be pretty cool? 10 out of 10 yeah. times. I like those odds, right? The combining transmission cooler is very, very easy to identify. Why? Because it's a thicker cooler. That's why it's easy to identify. Combining transmission, big transmission, big cooler. Agree? So if you start at the combining, it's number one, number two. Then you just put them in order. But the tendency is to want to start from the top and work your way down. Everybody always gets the combining right, but it's the top ones that they dork up. Any questions about that? Now, as we look at it, inside of there are going to be tubes, oil transfer tubes, for the purpose of transferring the oil to its associated transmissions. Excuse me. Transfer the oil to its associated oil coolers. And you can actually see the transfer tubes. A lot of them run on the outside, so you can actually see it. And then you have one on the inside. The other thing that that combining transmission is doing 
is driving a shaft which is going to drive the oil cooler fan that's going to produce the air required for sucking those hot air gases, hot air, the hot air coming through those coolers up to the exhaust port. Again, what do we do in this aircraft? We manage airflow. That's what we do. And if you get into that mentality, learning this stuff, it really does make sense. Maintenance panel. Now, back in the back, we have a maintenance panel. Okay. Believe it or not, the maintenance panel is on every aircraft to include the F model getting ready to come out and the G. It is a different maintenance panel on the F, but it's still a maintenance panel nevertheless. Okay. But what I like to do is make you put your thinking cap on right here, right now. Okay. Why? Because in order to answer the questions that I'm going to ask you, and I promise you I'm basing these questions based on the questions you're going to be asked out on the flight line, which is what I'm basing it off of. And here's exactly what they're going to do. They're going to stand you in front of this maintenance panel and they're going to ask you all sorts of series of questions. And they're going to expect you to know the answers. Okay? Now, here we go. You ready? Putting on your thinking caps, the first question I'm going to ask you is when you get your transmission chip light up in the cockpit, how many associated systems are involved? When you get the transmission chip light up in the cockpit, how many systems are involved? <laughs> you want the total number or mm -hmm. I want the total number. Six. Okay, I got a six. Anybody else? Well, if I didn't know better, I think it was Monday morning. You afraid of the question? Come on. So. Gentlemen, you got a transmission chip light up in the cockpit. <laughs> As you know. Okay. But wait a minute now. You said it's associated with six systems. What six systems? Okay. Normally I get six, I get five. Okay. But what is the right answer? Two. Okay, I get two from time to time. The right answer is four, gentlemen. Four. <coughs> Where does six come from? They're standing you in front of the maintenance panel and asking you about chip light up in the cockpit. What are you sitting here doing? One, two, three, four, five, six has to be the answer. That's what people are doing. But what did I just say the answer was? Four. Why four? What is the emergency procedure? Land as soon as possible. You're 100% correct. 100% correct. Look at the four locations involved. Forward transmission. I get a chip on that, that's bad. Yes, land as soon as possible. Combining transmission. I get a chip on that, bad. Land as soon as possible. Aft transmission. I get a chip on that, bad. Land as soon as possible. Half vertical shaft, which is why, what did we say the light was up in the cockpit? Transmission. Transmission chip, but this is a shaft. Okay, half vertical shaft, chip, bad, land as soon as possible. Which means these two can't be there because what are those answers for those two? Engine. Their engine transmission, if engine power is required for flight, land as soon as possible. Engine power is not required for flight. Emergency engine shut down. Refer to single engine. But it's confusing because you're reading chip detector and they're asking me a question. And what's happening in my head is I'm panicking. <gasps> chip. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, it's got to be six. Wrong. What they did is they broke it down based on the emergency procedures. How many chip lights do we have up in the cockpit? Which is the next question that they ask you. How many chip lights 
do you have up in the cockpit? And what are they? Three. There should be three, and three is the correct answer. There's no ifs, ands, doubts about that. Three is the correct answer. What are the three? Your main transmission chip light, your number one engine chip, your number two engine chip. But these emergency procedures, if I get these lights, the emergency procedure is an engine emergency procedure, which means what's my emergency procedure? If engine power is required for flight, land as soon as possible. Engine power is not required for flight, emergency engine shutdown, which is the only underlying step. Refer to single engine, which is a non underlying step. So you should really front load this clip. It would be nice, wouldn't it? That and the engine, really. You know? I mean, it would help us. But unfortunately, we need PPC front loaded. You need AFCS front loaded. You see the problem? Yeah. Which means if you ever have questions, and, and you can tell this to anybody, Come and get them answered. We'll answer them. Gladly. Okay? I'll pull out the pieces and parts and we'll answer the questions. Larry and John and, and Wayne will pull out the pieces and parts and answer the questions. You're right. This gets confusing. Which is why, technically, I'm not supposed to cover emergency procedures until the end. But by making you think right here, guess what? They're going to stick a little harder. Okay? Now, here we go. Are we done with the questions yet? Nope. When I get an engine chip light, how many possibilities are there? When I get an engine chip light, how many possibilities do I have? You have two. Four if you count both sides. Okay? But when I get one light, what are my possibilities? Two. It could be where or where? Transmission. It could be the engine transmission, or it could be the engine itself. But the nice thing about it is, is from your perspective, it doesn't matter. When I get that light, my emergency procedure is if engine power is required for flight, land as soon as possible. Engine power is not required for flight, emergency engine shut down, refer to single engine. That's it. And refer to single engines and not on the line step. It doesn't matter which location it is. And reality is, being able to identify the location is just purely from the maintenance side of the house. I don't want to have to troubleshoot both locations when it's only going to be one of the two. Now, how do we identify it though? If it's up here, it's associated with the transmission itself. If it's down here, it's associated with the engine. And that's how they're identifying the location off the maintenance panel. Any questions about that? Okay, now, here we go. You ready? What is your indication of a debris screen? What is your indication of a debris screen? The flight engineer or the crew chief telling you over the intercom system based on the maintenance panel that they have a debris screen. Now, what's the problem with the debris screens? There's a lot of confusion on what is a debris screen. By the time we're done today, you will know what a debris screen is. You will know what the difference between a chip detection system is and a debris screen is by the time we are done today. Okay? I'm not going to front load that. But what I am going to tell you is that based on the location, the emergency procedure, except for a one-time reset option, puts it into the category of a what? Not necessarily true. Okay, you're both giving me two different emergency procedures. Okay, but it puts it into the same category as a chip detector. Except for a one-time reset option. Sir, ma'am, I have the forward transmission debris screen. Okay, chief, reset it. Sir, ma'am, it didn't reset. Now it's land as soon as possible. Okay, sir, ma'am, I have the number one engine transmission debris screen. 
What's the emergency procedure now? Try to reset. Okay, it doesn't reset. If engine power is required for flight, land as soon as possible. Engine power is not required for flight. Emergency engine shut down. Refer to single engine. Right? Now, there is one more thing that we have to keep in mind. Your combining transmission has two debris screens. So what do you think the confusion comes in? If you're not paying attention... They're going to say left or right, and you're going to think it's engine when it's engine. Exactly. So you need to pay attention. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Matter of fact, you can get a debris screen and not get a chip based on how the system works. What? Well, actually, debris screens are on the return side of the house, but they are actually working two different ways. They are actually working two different ways that you need to be aware of. And that's where the confusion comes in. Okay, could we? Yes, we could. Based on what? Based on what we're talking about. We could, and there's that word again. You could, you may, you might, but what do they like to zing you with? You will get one. Not necessarily true. That is false. Yes, sir. RIP makes us do is brief the uh, engineers to ask him what he's going to say if we get a free screen, if he's going to say combining or left or right hand. And that's, that's a good thing. Okay. I always try to train when I train crew members, the pilots don't care if it's the left hand or right hand. All they care about is it's the combining transmission. That's all they technically have to report to you. But you got some keeping in mind they're young. Sometimes when they get into a crisis situation or what they perceive as a crisis situation, you know, their blood pressure goes up, their voice goes and changes octaves, and they start to panic. And then that's where it's your job to kind of calm them down and make sure that they are referring or relaying the proper information to you. Okay, Chief, what are you talking about? Is it the engine transmission? Or is it the combining transmission? And that's where all you have to do is ask. Is it the combining transmission? Or is it one of the engine transmission? And then that way you clear it up. And that way you can do the, emergency, the proper emergency procedure. Because if it's one of the left hand or right hand for the combining transmission, after a one-time reset option, it falls it into a category of the chip detector for the combining transmission. What's the What's the emergency procedure for the combining transmission chip? Land as soon as possible. What is it for the left hand or right hand engine transmission? If engine power is required for flight, land as soon as possible. Engine power is not required for flight, emergency engine shut down. Refer to single engine. Big difference, right? And that's why you have to pay attention. Okay, next. Here we go. If you get your main oil pressure light, if you get your main oil pressure light, how many systems, how many locations are you talking about? If I get my main oil pressure light, don't be afraid. Come on. You're either going to be. I'm either getting picked six. Six. <laughs> okay, anybody else? Four. Anybody else? Does main mean primary? Main means main. <laughs> hey, you're not going to hook me, Lad, on sick on that one. Main means main. That's what it's called. That's why. And actually, six is the correct answer. Six is the correct answer. One, two, three, four, five, six. So counting them across works out just fine. Okay, now here's the next question they'd like to ask. You ready? Now keep in mind, you're used to looking at it from what perspective? The cockpit perspective. So when they ask you questions standing back here like these, it gets a little bit confusing for you. But if they're asking you questions and you can answer it from here, you're not going to have problems up front, guaranteed. Okay, now you ready? If I get my main oil pressure light, how many different emergency procedures 
How many emergency procedure possibilities do we have? If I get my main oil pressure light, how many emergency procedure possibilities do we have? Four. Four? And you can see I'm giving you sufficient time to think about it in your head. Two. Three. Yeah, I forgot to add the other one for the other two. Yeah, okay. And that happens a lot. Four is one of the number one answers. The, the other one is just out of panic. It's six. But reality is there's three. What are they? Forward and combining has one set of emergency procedures. Aft and aft shaft has another set of procedures. And the left and right engine transmissions has another procedure. So you have three sets of procedures. Forward and combining is what? Unless you have any abnormal conditions, there's no underlying steps. If you have abnormal conditions associated with it, then it's a land as soon as possible scenario. Okay? Aft, aft shaft, what is the emergency procedures? Land as soon as possible. No if and sets about it. Left or right hand engine transmission, what's the emergency procedure? Is yeah, if engine power is required for flight, land as soon as possible. Engine power is not required for flight. Emergency engine shut down, refer to single engine. Now, not underlined step. I, I forget why we have to confirm aft shaft with the left engine now. That That's a good question. Why does the aft shaft have to be confirmed with the flight engineer? Because it's relative no. proximity to the generators? No, sir. There's no indication of that. There is no indication of it except for the light up in the cockpit. What, is they, what does he mean by there's no other indication? What else would you get in association with that light up in the cockpit? Everything's going to look normal. You get the light, you cycle through all the pressures. And ah! Look normal. That's it. There's no aft vertical shaft on that selector. Why? Because there's no oil pressure transmitter transducer. Ooh, there's that word again. It only has a what? A switch. Meaning what? It's only associated with a light. We tracking? That's why I gave you those definitions at the beginning. They are important. Whether you're wanting to be just a regular line pilot or whether you're progressing to become a pilot in command, maintenance test pilot, instructor pilot, if you use that tool, it's nothing more than a tool. But you can see how it can work for you. And actually, there's one more thing. You could actually get by without confirming it from the flight engineer. How? You see, this is why I ha have to kind of teach both. If, if everything's normal and you cycle through it, it only leaves one possibility. For okay, but you said the key word, cycle through again. I'm not looking for that. If it's in the scan position, if it's in the scan position and my indication is normal on my indicator and I have the light, by default it has to be the aft vertical shaft. So there's two rules of thumb. It ultimately still has to be confirmed. Why? Because it could be just a light. It could be just a faulty light up in the cockpit. And that's why it still has to be confirmed, ultimately. But some people will teach you that if you're in the scan position, your oil pressure is normal, and you have that light by default, hey, chief, check the aft vertical shaft, which makes you sound more intelligent, right? Instead of saying, hey, I got a light up here, but my oil pressure is normal. Yeah, you're right. By default, it has to be the vertical shaft. Question? Let's go ahead. All right. Now, any questions about anything we covered so far? Then if not, what we're going to do now is when I get my aux oil pressure light, look at me now, look at me. When you get your aux oil pressure light, how many locations are we talking about? Three. Three. What are they? Forward. Forward. 
Combining no. and aft. No. Combining and aft. Agreed. But that's why I said, look at me, bus. Good job. <laughs> okay. Just see you see behind. Okay. You know, because, yes, you're going to be standing in, the maintenance, in front of the maintenance panel a lot of times when they ask you, you'll be up in the cockpit. But I want to make sure. How many transmissions have an aux lubrication system? Three. The forward, the combining, and the aft. And that's why I'm doing this. You know, you notice we're covering the emergency procedures. The emergency procedures, when do we normally talk about emergency procedures? When we're going down. <laughs> Last. <laughs> Last. We're not going down, bus. We got the best aircraft in the Army inventory. Yep, but it always says later, as soon as possible, as soon as possible. Yep. Okay. Follow up by the checklist. Okay, now, here we go. You ready? Here's the other thing they like to do with these. While you're standing in front of the maintenance panel, they will say, at what pressure does that light come on? 20. 10. 20. 10. Less than 20. Less than 20. No. It's 20 I got three answers. I got three answers in less than a few seconds. But a ten, there's two tens on there. So were you right or wrong, Bus? I'm right. It's You're 20, right. Okay, 20, and I think 10. Bus is wrong. Okay, the magic number is four. Why four? Watch. Twenty. 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 The fourth one is ten. Twenty. 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 The fourth one is ten. 20. Okay, everybody see how we did that? So as long as you can count to four, you can get it right. Every fourth one is 10 PSI plus or minus one. So you were right, actually. Okay? Or 20 PSI plus or minus one. That's the favorite answer, plus or minus one. Why? Because you can't make it come on right at a certain pressure. Okay, so it's plus or minus. 20 PSI, 20 PSI plus or minus one, okay? Now, let me ask you this. What type of system, what type of indicating system are we talking about? What type of indicating system are we talking about, gentlemen? What are we talking about? Pressure transmitter. Okay, and bus says a transmitter. Okay, anybody else? What? A switch. a switch. The switch is the correct answer. Thank you for answering that. Okay, and got you all in the ballpark. Once he brought up transmitter, even though he was wrong, it got you all thinking, saying, wait a minute now, this is a light. It's not a gauge. So therefore, it, it has to be a switch by default. But that's why I showed you that little secret. If you're talking about a light, whether it's on the maintenance panel or up in the master caution, it's going to be associated with some type of switch. Why is that going to become important? Pretty soon we're going to show you the switches that turns them on and off. We're going to help you understand the switches. Why? Here we go. It's a component again, so it's maintenance. Wrong. That component is associated with what up in the cockpit? An indication. In this case, it's a light. Is that important to you as a pilot? Sure it is. And that's why piece and part recognition is a big deal. Okay. Yes, you've got a flight engineer or crew chief on board. They may or may not have more or less knowledge than you do. Okay. Some of you all have engineering degrees. Some of them have engineering degrees. But to say that you're going to get a strong flight engineer or crew chief all the time, and you may be the voice of reason in some of those emergency procedures. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay, here we go. You ready? When you get a transmission hot light, when you get a transmission hot light, how many locations are we talking about? When you get a transmission hot light, how many locations are we talking about? What? Transmission oil hot light. Three. Four. 
four. So if you combine those two, that would be one, then the half. Three. would be one, and then the uh, four to combine would be one, so three. Three? Three. three. Yeah. Okay, remember, what was the question? Not how many emergency procedures. It was how many locations. Five is the correct answer. Five is the correct answer. Now watch this. How many temperatures are we talking about? How many temperatures are we talking about, gentlemen? Two. 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 Okay. Anybody else? Three. Three. How many temperatures are we talking about? Okay. What? Okay, LT is going to go with one only because he's concerned that it's not two. Okay, we got five. I guess when you think about one. The, when you think about the oil though and, and the system itself, you couldn't have. I don't believe you could have one temperature different in one yeah. than the other. I guess it depends on it. Well, how many temperatures are you as pilots responsible for? And see, so here's why I'm doing it. Now, what did you two say? One. One. Okay. For those that said one, what is the temperature? 140. For the ones that said two, what are the temperatures? 190 and 140. For those that said three and five, I'm not even going to sit here and play with those. Okay. So, now, where does the confusion come in? Is everybody right about 140 being one of the numbers? Yes. yes. Is everybody right about 190 being one of the numbers? Yes. yes. So where does the confusion come in? Separate light. It's a separate light for the 190. Now, here we go. I'm going to help you on one more aspect. You ready? If it has anything to do with the maintenance panel, one temperature is the correct answer. What is the correct temperature? 140. Now keep in mind, watch this. Here's where the confusion comes in. Forward, combining, aft, left, right. Well, wait a minute now. What are, the, what are the left and right engine transmissions? What temperature am I responsible for? 149. 149. Now what are you doing? You brought the engine oil into it. Engine oil separate. We're talking transmission drivetrain. Okay. So where's the confusion come in? How many numbers are associated with the engine transmissions? Two. two. That is 100% correct. What are the two temperatures? 140 and? 190. 190. Now, here we go. Are you as pilots responsible for both of those? No. Yes. So, if you're responsible for both of them, don't you think it would be good to know where it comes from and what the difference is? Sure it is. Because we have how many hot lights on that master caution panel? Three is the correct answer. Two types, three. You got a transmission oil hot. You got a number one engine transmission hot. Number two engine transmission hot. These, regardless of location, is 140 degrees. These, whether it's the number one engine transmission or number two engine transmission, is what? 190. 190. Bingo. Okay, here's the catch 22, gentlemen. If it's on the maintenance panel, it's 140, and it's associated with one light up in the cockpit. And that is your oil transmission hot light. Good? If it is the 190, it is a direct relationship between this switch right here on the front of the engine transmission to the cockpit, to its associated engine transmission light, which the temperature here is what? Hopefully below 190. <laughs> 190. Okay, that's when the light comes on. So. It's 190. Now, 
I referred to that as a switch, right? Why? Because what are we talking about? We're talking about a light. Now, what you're going to find out is the next question that comes up is what? What's the IP going to ask you then? Where does that indication come from versus the indication up in the cockpit? Where does it come from? Well, if we already said that the one comes from here, and this one was which one? Engine transmission hot, which was what temperature? 190. So where does the second one come from? You ready? It's associated with the combining transmission itself. And it's right here. It's right here. Now, let's go ahead and nip all the questions in the bud. You ready? If I get this one, I will get this one, true or false. If I get this one, I will get this one, true or false? False. False. Why? Because it won't get the 190. It's probably because it can't get any oil from that. Okay. So he's talking about what avenue is he going into? He's doing a little bit of troubleshooting. Okay. Does he really need to troubleshoot? Not really. Okay. So, but he's narrowing it down to the reason why we got this one is transference of oil from here to here is not happening. Is that a possibility? Yes, sir, it is. Okay? But again, that's part of the troubleshooting. We're not really troubleshooting it. Okay? Why else is it false? If the oil is transferring, this is cooler oil. So if it's at 190, it may cool it down sufficiently that it's still below what? 140. Okay, now if I've been operating at 78 degrees the whole time and that oil is allowed to transfer, it may go up to 120 now. But that's still below what? Where this one trips. Okay? Now, if your IP asks you, prove to me that this is a switch. Why isn't it a probe or a bulb? Why is it a switch? Turns on or off. Turn something on and off, okay. What else? How else could I prove to an IP that that is a switch, not a bulb or a probe? What knowledge base are you going to pull from? You know, what other type of indications are you getting from that component? Okay. Well, he's already kind of putting you in the ballpark, but what do I know about the gauge? What's the max temperature of the gauge? 150 degrees. Well, why would I have a bulb or a probe going to a gauge that caps out well below the indication? Agreed? This trips at 190, but the gauge caps out at 150. So therefore, by default, this has to be a switch. You see how pulling from these knowledge bases is going to help you in the long run learning this aircraft and understanding this aircraft, which is more important. So what was the reasoning for that switch? That at 190, are we talking about serious impending failure? Like you bet your bippy. How many people have seen that picture down at the flight line? of an aircraft that's in the process of burning down to nothing. Yeah, they're obsessed with that picture. That started off as an engine transmission fire. And let's go ahead and nip it in the bud. What's the problem with the 190? The 190 is very close to the flash point of both the oil and the material that the transmission's made out of. We'll just nip it in the bud. Okay? A lot of people try to narrow it down to one or the other. Reality is they are both so doggone close it's not funny. If I remember correctly, when I looked it up, it was like five degree. It's a magnesium alloy. Is it 196? That's what, uh, yeah, he's been telling us. It's something like that, yeah. And the flash point of oil is, is in that ballpark, too. Now, what's the next question everybody says? Well, well, then why did the engineers make it so hot? Because reality is, when this one gets hot, it's going to get hot, period. So there's no, you know, stopping it. But you'll notice the emergency procedure for this one 
versus this indication are entirely different. Why? Because of the severity of the problem. At 190 degrees, it is no joke, gentlemen. Okay? Those IP, excuse me, those pilots on that aircraft did everything right. How do you know? Because they got it to the ground and they got the, all their passengers clear of it. They lost absolutely positively nobody. Okay? They did everything right and the result is still the same. We lost an aircraft. <coughs> okay? But luckily we didn't lose anybody. That's why this is so much more severe than that one. Which makes sense, right? 190 versus 140. Any questions about that? Okay, now, we went a little in depth about the maintenance panel, but you can see what we've learned and what we've gained from it. Now, this is what you're familiar with. And you notice I could have come here and you probably would have done a better job, to be honest with you. Why? Because you're trained on this perspective. But if you can answer the questions that we just asked, why you're staring at the maintenance panel, these are going to be no problem. I.e., when I get the transmission chip, how many locations are we talking about? How many locations are we talking about? You're afraid, I know, because of the camera. There's four. Okay? But how do I know that? What's the emergency procedure when I get that light? Land as soon as possible. Done. All right? Which means that it doesn't include your engine transmissions. Because if it did, it could not be just one emergency procedure, could it? It would have to be two. It would have to be for four locations, land as soon as possible. For two other locations, it would have to be if engine power is required for flight, land as soon as possible. And power is not required for flight, emergency engine shutdown, land as soon as, excuse me, refer to single engine. But it's not that. It's one emergency procedure, land as soon as possible. Why? Because you're only talking about four locations. And we can do that same thing with every one of those lights. But if you can do it from the maintenance panel, you'll be able to answer it from here. Are you still required to know the same thing? Sure. When you study your master caution panel, it will tell you what activates each and every one of those lights. Based on location, based on temperature, based on pressure, based on whatever the associated indication is. It tells you 20 PSI plus or minus one. 10 PSI plus or minus 1, what locations, right? Okay, components and operational characteristics, limitations and functions of the transmissions and the drive shaft. We're going to start off with the engine transmission. As we start off with the engine transmission, first off we know that the engine transmission is connected to the front of the engine via a quill shaft. That's where the engine transmission is. We have two of them. Both engine transmissions are completely identical, gentlemen. With some work, they are interchangeable between the left right and right side. Okay? With some work, they are interchangeable between the left and right side. In order to change this one from a left side engine transmission to a right side engine transmission, we take this, put it here, and we switch the lines around and then it'll fit on the other side. Now when we order them, initially, we order them per side, but if all I have in stock is a number one and I need a number two, that's not a reason not to go ahead and do the right thing and get the aircraft up. They are interchangeable legally at a VUM level, at the lowest level of maintenance possible. We can switch it around, no problem. Any questions about that? Engine transmission is going to take the power from the engine. Again, all transmissions reduce, all transmissions change angles. So it's going to reduce it and change the angle and send the power down via an engine drive shaft down to the combining transmission. Any questions about that? Now, the engine transmission itself is connected to the engine via what's referred to as a quill shaft which is nothing more than a small shaft. That's the quill shaft, okay? It's in between the engine transmission and the engine itself. 
This is connected to what portion of the engine? Anybody remember? The front of it. Very good. Okay, the output shaft. Output shaft. And then the engine transmission itself. Now, as we talk about it, we've referenced the Sprague clutch several times. We talked about it under engines. We referred to it before. And now we're going to talk about it from what is the Sprague clutch. Now watch this. Okay? What is the purpose of the Sprague clutch? Simple question. What is the purpose of the Sprague clutch? Okay, disengage the engine. Okay. So the, as the engine decays, it doesn't drag down the roof system. Okay. And actually, it allows the rotor to speed up away from the engine. Okay. It allows the other engine. It still allows it to drive the rotor train, drivetrain, so it will speed up. Okay. What else? Okay, I didn't hear the word that usually pops up. Everybody always pops up or worries about worst case scenario, which is for the purpose of what? Auto rotation. Why? Most of you are coming from a single engine aircraft. If that one power plant fails, that's it. There is no alternatives. So therefore, the Sprag clutch is meant to allow you to do an auto rotation. It disconnects the engine from the drivetrain allowing you to maintain your rotor RPM using the air force coming through the rotor system. Okay, But in this aircraft, we have to remember that we don't have just one engine. We have two. I can have a problem with just one engine, and I can shut that engine down with no effect on the drivetrain or that opposite engine. Why? Because of the Sprague clutch because of the Sprague clutch. And the Sprague clutch is actually part of the engine transmission. It's actually inside this mechanism. And we can actually, and I almost forgot, we can actually show it to you now, where before we couldn't. So when you come up during the break, you can actually come up and see, here's your Sprague clutch mechanism inside of here. Now. We use it a lot. We tell everybody about Sprague clutches. Every aircraft you learn has a Sprague clutch, rotary wing, and we throw it around like you understand exactly how a Sprague clutch works. We're not going to do that. We're actually going to show you. And basically what you have in there is a two ring system. You have this ring, which is going to be driven by the engine, which is this mechanism right here which is this mechanism right here. And then you have the inner ring that's actually going to result in turning your engine transmission, or excuse me, your engine drive shaft. We tracking? Now, here we go. What's going to happen is when this mechanism starts to turn, it's going to kick these teeth off in a way that's going to result in grabbing this inner ring and meaning now they're going to turn in conjunction with each other. If the engine fails and we shut it down, what's going to happen is this inner ring is now going to turn via what? What's going to turn this inner ring? The rotor, the rotor and the drivetrain, right? But now what's going to happen is it's going to kick these teeth off in a direction that it doesn't have any grab or any influence from that other ring. Fair enough? Now, what we need to talk about is some confusion associated with the Sprague clutch. And where does that confusion come into? And I'll tell you, it's a piece of information you're responsible for. Start the other engine. Yes, sir. You've got a time limit between starting the two engines of each other. 
I have to start that second engine within what of the first? Three minutes. Well, why? If I got a sprag clutch in there. Well, it, had, it probably has something to do with the RPM, which is turning. It doesn't probably allow it to move those teeth off to where it doesn't back drive it other end. Okay. See, and here's where the confusion comes in. Okay. Technically, that sprag clutch is supposed to disengage, and if it disengages in, in what we understand, then it shouldn't result in the driving of that drivetrain. That's not what it was meant to do. So then why do I have a concern? And the only thing I can do to help you understand that is I have to refer back to earlier models, okay, where we had a lot more sprag clutch engagement errors. Why? Because the system operated exactly the way you think it does. And it has a complete separation. But on this one, what they did is they maintained a little bit of a residual contact. To what purpose? To make it so that it takes a lot less to engage that sprag clutch than what it used to. Okay? But in doing that, they now created that residual contact that may be sufficient even though it's not meant to, it could result in that outer ring being drived through the other drivetrain or through the other engine. But now what's my concern now? Engine's running dry. The engine's what? Running dry. Running dry. Why, bus? Because the oil is on the accessory gearbox and it's not turning. Exactly. Okay. So what are we talking about? We're talking about that power turbine section of the engine. It's turning as a result of that residual contact. Fair enough. But what is not happening is that four and five bearing package is not being lubricated because the N1 section of that opposite engine is not turning. Now, what's the next concern come in? Well, what if I have to shut down that engine in flight? What's my concern? My concern is the same concern when I went to crank it. Now, do I have to motor the engine every so often to save the engine? The answer is no. They don't even want you focusing on that. Why? Two rules of thumb. One, if we shut down the engine, there was a problem with the engine anyway. Good? Two, not really. Go ahead. Exactly. That N1 section is being driven by residual airflow, or not residual airflow, but ram air coming in through that N1 compressor section, which is going to turn it sufficiently to get that oil pump turning, which is going to result in some lubrication going to it, which is why it's not a major deal. And remember, okay, why is that even a thought process? Because we do care about what we're doing. 712 engines were $680,000 a piece for turn-in value, okay? A 714 is 1.2 million. That's a lot of taxpayers' dollars, and we're responsible for that. So we do have to care to a point, you know? And so it's nice to know that, yes, the engine is still got ram air going in there, so therefore, it's going to be turning that pump sufficiently that gets some lubrication to it. Any questions about that? And now what we're going to do is I'm going to start this video, but before I do that, I'm going to tell you what you're looking for because just like the real thing, it's going to happen just like that. What's going to happen as a result of the engine turning this mechanism right here, it's going to result in turning this brown, this outer ring, which is brown on this engine transmission. These teeth are going to kick off to a way that it's going to grab this inner ring and then it's going to turn the engine drive shaft in conjunction with it. But it's going to happen so fast that if I don't tell you to look for it, you're not going to see it. So here we go. You ready? And it's just a real quick. Now, where do we run into our next question? How do we confirm a sprag clutch engagement? The first engine we cranked, what happened as a result of it? Rotor. Rotor started turning. Okay. 
How do we confirm it on the second engine? Rotor turns faster. But that's not what the dash stand says. It, the N1 accelerates through 70%. Two things we need to talk about with that. Okay? Why doesn't the fact that the rotor picked up when I started that second engine, why is it that the first engine I cranked when it turned the rotor, that doesn't confirm a sprite clutch for me? Because we don't know how the quality of the engagement is. Meaning what? Meaning that when it does go to accelerate, it could slip through. So we don't have a good confirmation. Even though the rotor blades are turning, even though the rotor RPM increased, we don't have that solidified confirmation that it's got a good grip until that engine accelerates through 70%. Now, what will it do if it doesn't accelerate through 70%? Which is the other thing we have to understand, right? What am I looking for in contradictory to if it doesn't accelerate through 70%? It's probably not going to get out of ground idle. Whatever that ground idle setting is, it's probably not going to get out of it. Why? In your mind, here we go. Speeding down a highway in a car, right? 150 miles an hour, drive shaft brakes. What's going to happen as a result of that drive shaft braking? What? Car's going to slow down. Okay, that's the obvious answer. But what else is going to happen? RPM. RPM. That engine's going to start screaming at me. So in theory, if my engine's not driving anything, what should this engine in my mind do? Go faster. It should go faster. But it's not. It's actually going to slow down. Why? Because it senses an overspeed. Okay? It's got an N2 governor in there that's going to say, hey, why do you want me to pump more fuel into that engine? It's not doing anything. It's not working, which is a turbine engine phenomenon. So you can't associate that to your car. And that's where the confusion comes in. So in reality, what happens is the system says, hey, you want me to pump more fuel in there to speed up the engine, but it's not working, so why should I? Make sense? Any questions about that? And that was whether it was 712s or 714s. In the 712s scenario, it has an N2 governor in there, a flyweight system. In the 714, what do we have? We got a DECU that senses an N2 overspeed. Well, we got a system in the, associated with the DECU, the Digital Electronic Control Unit, that senses an N2 overspeed that restricts fuel flow going into the engine based on that. So therefore, it won't accelerate, which is why that that's a fact. Any questions about that? Okay. Now, as we look at the next thing, operator's manual caution. The N2 section of the second engine starts turning when the first engine is started. However, the lubrication system of the second engine is driven by the N1 section, which does not begin to turn until the start sequence is initiated. We got all that right. Delay in starting the second engine will result in excessive wear on the N2 bearing packages and seals. Start the second engine within three minutes of the first. We caught all that. Any question? All makes sense a little bit now? That sprite clutch throws in a, a major confusion. Now, as we look at the engine drive shaft, the big thing about the engine drive shaft is here it is. It's a drive shaft. It is a balanced assembly. When say it's a balanced assembly, we're talking about the fact that it is balanced from your fixed adapter through to your spline adapter. Why does it have to be balanced? This is one thing that confuses a lot of people or they ask, why do we make a big deal about balanced? 
vibrations. Unusual vibrations. The more vibration that's created because it's unbalanced could result in immediate failure or it could be reducing performance and cause a failure later on down the line. So that's why we care about vibration. Why is that going to become a big deal? Because not only are the engine drive shafts balanced, all the drive shafts are balanced. So when we get to them, we'll cover that and say that again too. Now the combining transmission. The combining transmission is going to receive the torque through the drive shafts from the two engine transmissions. Combining transmission, again, it's a transmission, so it's going to reduce, change angles, and it's going to send it forward and aft. Forward via seven shafts to the forward transmission, aft via two shafts to the aft transmission. Any questions about that? Now, the other thing about the combining transmission, again, we said what's mounted to the engine transmission? How many coolers? <coughs> three. Why three? Why three coolers? It's not a trick, gentlemen. Why three coolers? Exactly. You got the left and the right, and you got the combining. It's not a trick. Why is that important? Because what we're going to do when we get to the combining transmission, we're also going to tell you one of the jobs of the combining transmission is it has the reservoirs associated with those two engine transmissions. In other words, what? The oil storage associated with it. What else is it's going to have a lot of the other pieces and parts associated with the two engine transmissions as well as the combining transmission. So although it's one assembly, it's actually broken down into three systems. Keep that in mind. Okay. It's also going to be driving a shaft coming up through to drive your oil cooler fans. Now we'll just go ahead and nip some of the questions in the bud. Flight School 21 is not usually too bad, but some of you experienced Army aviators, in this case experienced crew members, one of the big things that everybody argues is why do we have a drive shaft system instead of a electric cooling fans, okay? Because of the speed that these fans are being driven and everything, they just decided that shaft-driven fans are safer than fans that could fail because of a loss of electricity. And so that's why they opted to do it. Um, for those that don't know, we went through a series of troubles with the cooling fan itself for the combining transmission and the shaft itself. And that's when everybody started bringing up the questions, why not electric? And we did. We threw that around. But there was just too many concerns with a loss of electrical power. Then we're going to lose a lot more fans than just hydraulic cooling fans. Because the hydraulic cooling fans have their own, or system has its own coolings. Again, what, it, what was the intent? The intent was to separate as many of these systems, reducing the possibility of a complete loss of more than one associated system. Seems a little excessive to have to land an aircraft as soon as possible because a fan goes out. Agreed. But what people don't realize is hydraulic fluid is the most dangerous fluid we have on this aircraft. Everybody always thinks fuel is. Fuel is a is a teddy bear compared to that hydraulic fluid. That hydraulic fluid as a vapor has a very, very low flash point. Okay? To the best of my knowledge, we have had two cases where hydraulic fluid fumes got ignited, went through the aircraft, killing everybody on board. Okay? So prior to even hitting the ground, everybody on that aircraft was burned by a flash fire and killed. Okay? And that's why we want the aircraft down as soon as possible. Okay. Okay, we'll talk about it. Synchronizing shafts, again, what are we going to tell you? The synchronizing shafts are a balanced assembly. Now, something that we don't do is we don't presume to throw around terms that everybody thinks has a meaning. We're going to make sure that we know what the pieces and parts are. Why do we have to know what the pieces and parts are? For what value to you as an IP, excuse me, you as a pilot? Pre-flight value. 
okay? People are going to go say, go look at the, the adapter assembly. And what's the bad thing that we are all guilty of? Including me. What are we all guilty of? <gasps> I'm told to go look at the adapter assembly. Uh, okay. Okay. I'm going to do as I'm told. What in the heck is the adapter assembly? Right? And we've made that presumption a lot of times. We're not going to make that presumption. We're going to make sure that you know exactly how the breakdowns are and what we're talking about when we throw out the terminology. Where are the adapters? <laughs> exactly. We're going to show you. How many adapter assemblies? Okay? So we're going to run down and we're going to break down up what the drive shafting consists of. Why? Because again, there is no redundancy for these. If this system fails, that rotor system is going to intermesh and it's all over but the crank. And a lot of times it's presentable, preventable at our level, which is what's the big deal. Okay, a lot of people say, why seven shafts? Why not one shaft? Could we have gotten away with one shaft? Torsion. Okay, torque, torsion. Okay, what else? Why seven shafts, not one? Okay, the, one of the standard answers is, is if that one shaft fails, it's going to be devastating. Guess what? If any one of the seven fails, it's going to be the same result. Okay, so why seven shafts? Easy. Exactly. This aircraft is bending, bowing, and flexing. If we had a single shaft, how would you keep, in the case of it bending and bowing and flexing, how would you keep from fuselage shaft contact? You wouldn't. So that's why we have seven identical shafts. Okay? Except for the number seven shaft. Now, they go in order. Shaft number one, two, three, to seven. Eight and nine behind it. That's eight, nine, the, the same eight and nine are shaft, identical shafts to themselves. Okay, but no, not to the front, no. These shafts are bigger than these two back here. They don't have as much distance to cover. Okay? Number seven shaft, the other way it's different is most of the shafts consist of one end like this. And where's my piece that I just passed around? And then one piece like this. That's going into a bearing assembly. But the number seven shaft is actually two ends just like this and it's a little shorter. Okay? And so's the number nine. Why? Because those are the shafts that we pull in order to pull the other shafts. Or the number nine shaft is what we use now to phase the rotor system. What did we say phasing of the rotor system consisted of? making sure those blades traveled in between each other. That's phasing of the rotor system. How do we do it now? We pull that number nine shaft. We align them the way we need them aligned. We put that shaft back in. And that's what keeps them synchronized. Any questions about that? Let's go ahead. Okay. Any questions about anything we covered so far? Then here we go. We're going to look at the bearing and support assemblies. How many times have we heard bearing and support assemblies before? Quite a bit. Okay. Now we're actually going to look at them. What are the bearing packages? These are your bearing packages right here. Now, in looking at these bearing packages, they are a ball bearing type system. Now, why do you all care what type of bearing systems in there? Pre-flight pre value. What about pre-flight value? If they're ball bearings, what? They need a lot of grease, don't they? Okay, which means that they're going to sling grease. So one of your jobs is you've got to make sure that it's cleaned up up there. Why? As it slings grease, what else is going to be happening? It catches dirt, dirt, right? it catches dirt debris, grit, grime, and all that nasty stuff, and then guess what? It's going to weigh it down and then what's going to happen? 
it's going to fall down on those shafts. When it falls down on those shafts, what's going to start happening? It's going to start heating up that spot, right? Which will eventually cause a failure. Not a very good thing. Or with all that dirt and grit, it could end up underneath the drive shaft, which will result in a failure. There's a lot of concerns. So we have to make sure that it's wiped out. And I'll tell you right now, it's a catch-22. What's the catch-22? I'm happy when it stops slinging the grease. But then I have to have a concern that what? There's not su sufficient enough grease in there to maintain the cooling and lubrication of those bearings. So it's always a catch-22. When it stops slinging grease, you're happy because it's less mess to clean up. And it is. It's messy. And for those that have the pickle suits, if you want to keep them, because as soon as you go to DX them, what are you getting in place of them? Yep, those. And some people are desperately trying to hold on to their pickle suits. Okay? But as soon as you turn them in, they're gone. So getting grease on them is a reason to turn them in and lose them. So. Well, what are you looking for then? What's the, what's the balance? Because if there's no grease, it's bad. Run. If there is grease. And what you're going to find out is a lack of grease is going to manifest itself in a different way that we're going to talk about here in just a second. Because if you're doing, if your crew members are doing their job, you shouldn't see a mess. You shouldn't see a mess because our crew members actually take shop towels up there and wipe it all out. Okay? So even on pre-flight value, you shouldn't see a mess. But what will happen is it will manifest itself a different way. And we'll talk about that here in just a second. Okay? Now, the support assemblies. What's the purpose of the support assemblies? The support. Okay, but what's the relevancy of them? Keep stuff balanced. Huh? Keep it balanced. Okay, part of the balancing. What else? Allow movement. Huh? Allow movement. Allow movement, which is going to come. Yes. What else? It's part of the aligning process of those shafts. So if they're bent, damaged, stepped on, or any of those, what's going to happen? Is it's going to offset or off align those shafts, which is going to result in what? higher vibration, which is going to result in higher stress, which is going to reduce performance capabilities or cause instantaneous failures. So you have to look at those. Now, I'd like to tell you that, you know, you'll never find them damaged, but I've seen people pry up with them and bend them. I've seen people step in places they're not supposed to step. It's funny. It's like having the words no step is a magnet for people to step there. You know, it's, it's amazing. No step. Okay. And they step there. Where's the favorite one? Right here, you got that cowling for the engine drive shafts. What do people like to do? Oh, step. You know, and bigger than dog doo doo, it says don't step, but people step on there. And then they wonder why those shafts end up getting scarred because of things touching them are, that aren't supposed to be touching them. And guess what? You can't pre-flight those. You don't remove that cowling so you can look at them. So they get expected every so many hours. Well, could be bad. OK, so that's where those support assemblies are. And that's basically aligning the shafts or part of that aligning process. Adapter and plate assemblies. Now, as we look at the adapter assemblies, they're nothing more than a means to connect one shaft to another. That's all these adapter assemblies are doing. They're just adapting it for what process? To put in these adapter plates. Now, what's the problem with these plates? A couple things. One, what am I looking at them for? They're straight, not bent. Not they're open. straight, not bent, ripped, torn, cracked, any of that stuff. But now, here's the thing. What does it tell you as a pilot if you find more than one of those bent, cracked, ripped, torn, besides that you're not going to fly that aircraft? But what does it tell us about the aircraft? Something's vibration. Something's not balanced. Something's not balanced, vibration. Okay. 
Misalignment. Misalignment, man. Yeah. No. How about how about a better answer? How about that aircraft probably experienced an over torque situation that didn't get written up? What would bend more than one adapter assembly or cause more than one adapter assembly to be bent? An over torque situation. Why? Because that's one of the jobs of those flex packs. One, to allow for that bending, bowing, and flexing. But two, in the case of an over torque, it'll absorb it. So where are you more likely to see that? In the outputs? And the of the transmissions are in those sections or more towards the middle where it's, it's It's too, it's too diversified depending on the situation. But what people don't realize is you have these adapter plates in one direction and then coming through the other direction is that next shaft's mounting. So what happens in an over torque situation, they torque against each other and these end up getting bending, bowing, and flexing, and ripped, torn, cracked, all those famous words that people tell you to look at them for. Okay? Now, what's the other phenomenon that you could see? Another phenomenon that you can see is just like two or three of them bent out. And probably in just one location. Why? Stepped on it. Somebody stepped where they didn't supposed to be stepping. And again, I'm telling you, some of these young maintenance people don't really have a grasp of exactly what they're doing. And you'll see them prying on stuff using these flex packs or adapter assemblies. Not good. But that's why you have to look at them. That's why you have to know, what am I looking at? Oh, man, there's only one. Probably somebody stepped where they weren't supposed to step. But that's still cause for rejecting the aircraft. Any questions about that? Okay. Shock mounts. Shock mounts are fun to talk about, especially when if you look at these shock mounts, you'll notice these are the old style shock mounts. This is what we used to have. Okay, but what was the problem? The same concern that we had. If these failed, this spring would break and pieces and parts would end up underneath. So what they went was to an all rubber shock mount. To what avail? Now what we have is we have two pieces of rubber connected to a bearing package and then you have the bearing that goes through and what happens is this mounts to that bearing assembly and then the bearing assembly, or excuse me, the other portion of the shock mount mounts to your support assembly for the purpose of what? Two things. One, that's what's going to allow that shaft to do what we refer to as float. How many people have heard that term? Okay, we're going to identify that here in just a second, but this system allows for that to occur. The other thing that it does, you ready, is it prevents the transference of vibration. I'll say that again. It prevents the transference of vibration. You'll notice what I didn't do. I didn't specify a direction, did I? Why? Because you're going to hear some people say that it prevents vibration from transferring between the shafting to the fuselage or vibration from the fuselage transferring into the shafting. My contingency is if it'll do it one way, it'll do it the other way. Okay? Now, how many people in their time flying have noticed that the flight engineers and the crew chiefs are walking down the tunnel cover area? Yeah, you've actually done it, huh? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, but you're getting to that point. Okay, now why are they doing that? Because what will happen is if these break, what will happen is a vibration will be experienced. Now, depending on how many breaks will determine the severity of the vibration. Okay, now reality is, is it going to cause the aircraft to crash or anything like that? No, it's not. Okay, we'll just pick up a vibration. Why? Because it's going to be misaligned. 
and as a result of it being misaligned, you'll pick up a vibration. That's what's going to happen. Now, what you're looking for is because they're rubber, you're going to look for the normal terms, the normal things associated with rubber, which is what? Dry rotting, rips, tears, cracks, pieces missing, or disformity of all kinds. So we're going to pass some around. We're going to pass one, two around. And we're going to let you look at them. Okay? Any questions about that? Now, this whole assembly, this whole assembly is sometimes referred to as what? A Thomas coupler? How many people have heard that? Okay. Now, what's the problem with the Thomas coupler? The Thomas coupler was associated with some other aircraft types, but their coupling system was made by the Thomas Corporation. Just like our shock mounts are sometimes referred to as what? Lord mounts. Not because if one fails, it's going to be anything major, but because the Lord Corporation is who makes them. But the Thomas Corporation is not who makes ours. But the problem is that those names from the other aircraft types transfer into this. So when they talk about the Thomas coupler, they're still talking about this system. But that's not correct, just so everybody understands that. The Thomas Corporation does not make ours. So the black one is a bad one and the brown one is good? Yes. Okay. Yep. And just about everything you want to not see is on the black one. Now, for an object in tunnel cover area, we already talked about the importance of that. Damage to the shock mounts, we already talked about. Damage to the drive shaft, we already talked about. Freedom of movement longitudinally. This is the one, the other thing that burns me to no end. And the reason why is when we're talking about the shafting floating, we mean it should be able to float. And that's what they're talking about, being able to move longitudinally. Anybody, any size, any shape, should be able to take this shafting from anywhere and make sure that it moves. Okay? Now remember earlier we talked about this being a bearing package and needing a lot of grease. A lot of times if it doesn't float, it's because this bearing needs more grease. Okay? Now, when I say that it floats, that doesn't mean you take your leg, hop, hop it up onto the, for, the combining transmission or the forward transmission, cowlings, and you push off and it, that's not floating. Okay, floating means that you can grab it and there's going to be movement. And why is that important? Again, what's this aircraft doing? Bending, bowing, and flexing, which is what that floating capability is made to absorb. Any questions about that? Does uh, the 7 still float in the way it's designed? Sure it does, because it still goes into a, a same type of mounting bracket. Okay? So it will still float, plus it's near a splined adapter in the front of it. Okay? Now, what will happen if it doesn't float is it will create stress points that could result in an area of failure. Could happen immediately, could happen in the next flight. And one thing I have always trained for people to do is remember, if that aircraft crashes tomorrow and you flew it the day before, you think subconsciously it's not going to be in the back of your head. Did I miss something? Did I do something wrong? Should I have done something better? And you don't want to live with that. And that's why when I tell people to look at this aircraft, look at it not from just your flight's perspective, but look at it from what could possibly or think about it from what possibly could happen down the line if we don't do the right thing. Yeah, okay, it may be okay for my flight, but it may not be okay for the next flight. And guess what? If I knew it was broken on my flight, do you think it got any better for the next flight? But what's that pilot and crew going to be thinking? Ah, it'll probably be okay. But if they knew that you flew out on it with six hours like that already, 
Do you think they might have a little bit of a different thought process going on? Man, Jeff flew like that six hours. Well, maybe we better not take the risk because it could be my flight that it's going to fail in. Does that make sense? Okay. Forward transmission. Forward transmission, we said, is going to receive its power from the combining transmission. But now we're going to go and we're going to highlight two more things. One, all your upper flight controls are mounted directly to that transmission housing. What do we mean upper controls? We're talking about those upper dual boost actuators are actually mounted to it. Okay? The transmission itself is completely self-contained. It has everything that it needs, pumps, filters, chip detectors, pressure switch, um, pressure transducers, transmitters. They're all completely self-contained, meaning we're not pumping anything anywhere. Okay? And then last but not least, not only is the forward transmission going to be tilted nine degrees and mounted, tilted forward, but it's also not only going to be receiving power from the combining transmission, but it's also going to be driving what component? The what? Flight one. The number one flight control hydraulic pump is mounted to the forward transmission. And we'll, you'll see it here in just a little bit. Aft transmission, whew, wow. What a busy transmission, mounted at four degrees, tilted forward. What's the tilt of the transmission for? Ground handling, ground taxing of the aircraft. Now, the aft transmission is not only going to be driving the aft vertical shaft, which is going to result in turning the rotor, but it's also going to be driving what else? Generators. Two generators, number one and number two generators, as well as what? Flight number two. Flight number two and utilities. So it's driving two hydraulic pumps and two generators in addition to driving the amp vertical shaft. And again, it's self-contained. Now the aft vertical shaft. Again, as we talk about the aft vertical shaft, it, by every definition of the word, it is a shaft. But it gets categorized in a lot of cases as a transmission. Not because of its requirements, but because what indication systems are going to be tripped up in the cockpit. It doesn't say aft vertical shaft chip light, does it? It doesn't say aft vertical shaft pressure, does it? It says transmission main oil pressure, right? It says transmission chip. <coughs> and that's why it gets categorized that way. And what are we talking about when we're talking about this aft vertical shaft? The aft vertical shaft, this is the entire aft vertical shaft, almost eight feet tall. This is your thrust bearing. A lot of your limitations for airspeed are based on protecting that thrust bearing. Why? Because that thrust bearing is stressed vertically all day long. If you haven't put two plus two together yet, that thrust bearing is what is lifting the aft end of this aircraft. Because that thrust bearing, the aft transmission is mounted in place, the aft vertical shaft slides into a spline gear in the top of it, and then the thrust bearing is mounted to the fuselage. And that's what holds that aft transmission and the uh, vertical shaft together. So literally what is picking up the aft end of that aircraft is that thrust bearing, which is why we put so much emphasis on protecting it. It's stressed vertically all day. It's not stressed laterally, which is what would be put on it if our LCTs are not programming correctly. Why do we make such a big deal about the aft vertical shaft? Because at eight feet tall, here we go again. You ready? How does that look? Imagine that happening on that shaft. Split right in two. So that's the length and stress that's placed on, on it. The forward's just a small little shaft, so how much forces are applied to it? Not that much. Not that much. Okay. You got a pressure switch. What's the relevancy of the pressure switch? What's the relevancy of the switch? The switch. Okay. Which means what to you? The light. It turns on and off a light. Okay. But what doesn't it say? You don't see a pressure transducer transmitter up there, do you? 
meaning that it's not connected to what type of system? Gauge. To a gauge. Are we tracking? Okay. We got a chip detector and we got another oil filter. Any questions about that? Okay, learning step activity three. Describe the transmission lubrication system. Forward transmission has how many lubrication systems? Two. What are they? Main and aux. Now we didn't say primary, did we? We said main and aux. Why? Why, why can't we classify one as primary, one as secondary? What? Okay, what else? Okay, what else? Well, you assume that if the primary fails, the secondary picks up where it's left off. Okay, what else? What would be the main reason, gentlemen? Lubricating. Huh? Lubricating? No, not what I'm looking for. Can't select. What? Cannot select. Not what I'm looking for. How's it labeled up in the cockpit? That's what we're doing. We're associating it with what indications you're going to get up in the cockpit. Yes, you're right that we don't get an aux lubrication indication except for what? Except for the light. That's all we get. Why? Because it's not hooked up to a what? Transducer transmitter. So therefore it's not hooked up to a gauge up in the cockpit. But the gauge in the Master Caution says main and auxiliary. It doesn't say primary and secondary. And that's the only main reason. Could it have been labeled that way? It could have been. They chose not to. Why not? One, because of some of the associations that go along with the difference between primary and secondary. Okay? And they chose not to. Is the other reason why? Okay? Combining transmission. As we look at the combining transmission, we said that the combining transmission, the combining transmission itself has how many lubrication systems? The combining transmission itself has how many lubrication systems? Two. Two. Okay, you see where you got to be careful. The combining transmission itself has how many lubrication systems? Two. Now, watch this. How many lubrication systems are associated with the combining transmission? That should be four. Then. That should be four. Exactly. Why four? What? Left, right, and the combining main. Exactly. But what didn't we say? We didn't say anything about an aux lubrication system in, in association with the left and right hand, did we? Okay, and some people try to give a system to something that doesn't exist. The engine transmissions only have a main lubrication system. If that one system fails, then there is no redundancy. Everyone understand that? And then the aft transmission has how many lubrication systems? Two. Two. Now what's the catch-22 to this? How many? What are the titles of those lubrication systems? Main and aux. It didn't change. It's not a trick. Okay? Believe it or not, I'm not trying to trick you. It's the main and aux. Okay? But what do we have to keep in mind on this system? What's the catch-22? The aft shaft. The aft shaft and? The two generators. Why is that going to be a big, hairy deal? Because later on, when we reemphasize emergency procedures, we have to keep in mind the association with the main, or excuse me, with the aft vertical shaft and with the generators. Why? Because if I get an oil pressure and I determine it's the aft transmission, my emergency procedure is now what? Land as soon as possible. Why? Because you've got the aft transmission as well as the aft vertical shaft and the two generators associated with that one lubrication system. If it's non-existent, then we have to land as soon as possible. What's the next concern? Oil transmission hot. Aft, tra aft transmission. Now what's the association? The generator. So what's that emergency procedure? Electrical load reduced. 
land as soon as possible. We're still landing as soon as possible. Now we got the additional step of electrical load reduce. And I'm going to be very gracious and I'm going to bail out, gentlemen. Why? Because there's too many opinions on what that term electrical load reduce means. I can tell you what it means to me and I can tell you what my mindset would be. But some of the IPs agree with me, some of them don't. And I'm not going to set you up for failure. Don't okay. fail. Let us, be, let us be big boys and make our own. Well, decision. when we get electrical class, you may put two plus two together. Okay? And in all honesty, if you do want to know offline, I will let you know what I, my opinion is. Okay? But I tell you right now, some of the senior IPs don't agree with me. Okay? And I don't want to set you up for failure. You mean you can't put it on memory? That too. <laughs> okay? <coughs> All right, sumps and reservoirs. What is the big hairy deal about sumps versus reservoirs to you? What is your concern? What? The location. Sump is going to be in the bottom. Thank you. Okay, now what else? Checking the levels. When do I check them? What's the difference between a sumper and a Reservoir system. We've already talked about a reservoir system once in association with what? What? Okay, but what else? The engine. Okay, guess what? The same principles are going to be applicable. Your forward and aft transmission have sumps. Your combining transmission has a reservoir. But not only does it have a reservoir, it actually has how many reservoirs? There's actually three. Okay, but where does the confusion come in with that? Although there's three different reservoirs in there, and there's three different sight glasses on there, how many fill ports do I have? One. One. Sounds kind of contradictory to me, doesn't it? And what happens is, that fill port is going to fill the combining transmission. And as it does, what happens is, and I'm going to point it out in this picture, what happens is that oil transfers through that screen right there and starts to fill the associated engine transmissions. And that's how it fills. Okay, let's nip all the questions in the bud. Can oil transfer from here back into here? Sure it can. The screens aren't one-way check valves, they're screens. All the screens do is prevent the transference of dirt and debris and grit and grime from transferring from one place to the other. Okay? It doesn't stop it from going from here to here, but what would we have to do to allow that to occur? We would have to get into an unusually nose-low attitude. Is it possible? Sure it's possible. And then what? Associated with the cap, uh, the fill port, is a vent for the possibility of what? All that oil transferring back into there, it's better to vent it overboard and lose some of it than to overpressurize the system and cause many major damage to lines, seals, and gaskets. Any questions about that? Now, whether it's a sump or a reservoir, the type of oils we use are identical for the engine, 2369 or 9er, 7808, based on what? Based on the temperatures that we're going to be operating. Minus 32 degrees and up, we use 2369 or 9er. Minus 32 degrees and below, we use 7808. And then we also refer to the Barney oil, but keep in mind, because we have the two different types of oils, we also have the process of what? Or the concern of what? Mixing them. If we should mix the oils, what do we have on us? Yes. I, limitation. We can only fly for six hours, which means any time that the oils become mixed, we have to do a dash 13 entry for the purpose of what? For the purpose of keeping track of that flight time. But keep in mind that Reality is, what did we say about the engine mixing of oils? Chances are we won't know that we mixed the oils. If we knew we were mixing the oils, we probably wouldn't have done it. 
But again, if bus crews aircraft one, two, three, and I crew aircraft two, four, five, he uses 7808 on his aircraft, I use 2369 or 9 on mine. If I'm gone and he has to come and fly my aircraft, and he determines a transmission needs to be serviced or an engine needs to be serviced, out of instincts, what's bus going to use? He's going to use 7808 because that's what he had on his aircraft. What did I say I used? 2369 or 9er. Did bus know that he, he mixed my oils? No. Did he do it on purpose? No. So when will it manifest itself? Will it manifest itself? When, they check it. when we do the oil samples. Every 25 hours, unless that's changed, we do oil samples for that process. There's your sump for your forward transmission. What's the difference? I'm going to check oil on my reservoir system. When? Within 30 minutes of shutdown, which means what? As I'm pre-flighting this aircraft, if I see that the combining transmission's low, I'm going to do two things. One, hey chief, does it normally run low? Is that okay? Why? Because I can't make it a determination unless I'm checking it within 30 minutes of that aircraft shutting down. Which is why when I used to train crew members, this was one of my pet peeves. This one and one more. Why? Because when you come out here and pre-flight this aircraft, when those next crew members come out here and daily these aircraft, when you look at these levels for these reservoirs, you can't get a good picture of whether it's good or bad. So that's why it's very important on post-flight that those get checked. There's the bottom of the forward transmission. There's the sump. There's your cooler. Chip detector slash debris screen. We'll talk about that here in just a second. There's that hydraulic pump. And there's your main oil filter for the forward transmission. So the front of the aircraft's this way. The back of the aircraft's this way. Everyone tracking? Okay, aft again has a sump. And now when are we going to check a sump system? When are we going to check a sump system? Huh? When it's cooled down. When it's cooled down, but that's not what the dash 10 says. After 30 minutes. Reservoirs are within 30 minutes, sumps are after 30 minutes. Why? We want to give that oil a chance to come back down and into the sump. When do we check oil in my car? After it's been, immediately after it's been running or after it's been sitting for a while. Why? What type of system's on the car? A sump. So I have to let all that oil get back down to the sump system. Bus is lucky I'm deaf. Okay, I missed that one. All right, any questions about that? <laughs> Talking about the pumps. As we talk about the pumps, how many sets of pumps are we going to have in the forward transmission? How many pumps are we going to have in the forward transmission? Why two? Main and aux. Why three? Ah, okay. And those are the two answers, and those are the two correct answers. As long as you know what. You got one for the main, one for the aux, for oil, and then, of course, the flight control hydraulic pump is mounted to it, which is a pump. Okay. So both those answers are acceptable as long as you clarify it, okay? But as long as you understand how many are associated with oil, which is what we're talking about, Bus. Hydraulic oil. Okay. You're being tricky, but okay. And it says on the pumps, it doesn't say oil. Good point. Okay. Sorry. Main and aux. That's okay. That's okay. Those are both acceptable answers as long as you understand why. Okay? Why is it going to get confusing? How many pumps? Okay, we're going to go ahead. How many pumps do we have on the aft transmission? Depends on what kind of pump. Two lubricated pumps. Two lubricated pumps for the combining transmission, a main and a loop. Okay, or main and aux, excuse me. Or they will accept four as long as you specify what? A main and aux and two hydraulics. Okay. Now, why does that get confusing? That sounds pretty self-explanatory to me. Now we're going to get into the combining transmission. How many pumps does the combining transmission have? Four. Four? 
three. Anybody else? hit the key point. Why do we need a scavenge pump? In this system, where's all the oil? It's above it, right? So not only are we pumping it out, we have to suck it, or we're pumping it in, we have to suck it back out. So how many pumps are on the combining transmission? I'll do the math for you. Eight. How many systems are we talking about? Four. Why four? Two for the combining, one for the number one engine, one for the number two. Four systems, two pumps apiece, eight total. Which is why when you look at this combining transmission, they're going to point to the two housings and all you're going to have is a big hump right here. And they're going to expect you to be able to identify which pumps which. Why? or what series of pumps are which. Because when you look at it, this is what you have in there, gentlemen, is a series of four pumps. You got four on the right side, and you got four on the left side. So what do we have? In the case of the right side, which is the one I have in my hand, so we'll just go ahead and cover it. You ready? If you take that picture on page 16 and divide it into four on each one of those white boxes, that's what you have is a series of four pumps per side. And what you have is the first one, in the case of the right side, is the combining transmission aux lubrication system. Directly behind that is the combining transmission aux scavenge pump. Directly behind that is the number two engine transmission scavenge pump. And then beside that is going to be the number two engine transmission pump. Over here, the front one's going to be the combining transmission main lubrication system, combining transmission main lubrication scavenge pump, number one engine transmission scavenge pump, number one engine transmission pump. So what are they using? They're not using the hump to trick you. They're using the side. That's what they're using against you, just so you know. So if they're looking at the left side, then they're looking at the number one engine transmission. That's a no-brainer. Why? Because what's on this side? The number one engine transmission. But the problem is you've got a main lubrication system for the combining transmission. You've got a scavenge lubrication system for the combining transmission. Main is first. Hmm? Main is first. You can think about it that way, but it's not, they're both going to be pumping simultaneously. So one's not first, one's not second. But if that's what you use to keep it organized in your head, it's, that's fine as long as you understand they're, they're pumping simultaneously. Okay, that back piece will come off, so please be careful. And that's the picture you should have seen on page 16 of your handout. Again, if you just divide it into four pumps, that's the breakdown of the pumps. Any questions about that? Okay, main oil filter. I'm going to cover all the main oil filters all simultaneously. Why? What do the main oil filters have? What? They have button indications. All the main filter assemblies have button indications, okay? Impending bypass, differential pressure indicators, LRBs, and as we learned 
previously pop-outs okay they go by all names but the bottom line is here's the thing here's the main filter housing there's the button it's extended now what do we do when we find this button popped on pre-flight what tell the chief what pump it back in and run it for 30 minutes or run it yeah. push it back in lieutenant all right so I'm wrong Aha! Yep. okay it doesn't have to be reset from the inside it actually has to be pulled apart and what happens is we have to flip it upside down and then push it in now what does that have to do with your world what's so important to you about that we go out to pre-flight the aircraft and that button's popped you aren't flying or you got a doggone good chance of not flying why because how long do you think it's going to take to pull that system apart and get everything done it's going to take time which means this is Tom's other pet peeve those doggone crew members better post flight these buttons okay why because if a pilot or a crew member comes in and says man aircraft 234 has got a button popped I'm gonna to come to a 10-foot hover why because it should have been found on post flight then we could have either put another aircraft on the schedule or we could have come in early and got it ready but an hour two hours prior to takeoff isn't going to be sufficient time to get it pulled apart now what happens is a ball bearing pops in behind there now to the contrary your aux filters for systems that have aux systems your aux filters do not have differential pressure indicators why because it's the same oil it's just being moved differently through different routes and so basically if that button pops and we determine that the oil is contaminated then what they will do is they will do follow-on maintenance which will include checking those filters and so when you look at them there's the main filter for the forward transmission there's the aux filter and the main filter for the aft transmission you can see the main filter and then the aux filter and all the aux filters again they don't have differential pressure indicators why because the oil is the same they're just moving different routing okay so there's the main filter there's the aux filter main filter for the combining transmission but keep in mind how many main filters are on the combining transmission three there's the aux for the combining transmission and then you have two more mains back behind the combining transmission so back here in the back to the left and right of the fan shaft you have your two filter housings and that's what's coming around one of the engine transmissions is coming around any questions about that jet protection screens these were an add-on after that incident that happened in Mannheim okay how many people know about that accident that happened in Mannheim aircraft went down killing 48 people on board okay 44 jumpers four crew killed them okay this was an add-on after that accident okay that was also a procedural problem that we have gotten rid of that procedure but what they did is they added these jet protection inlet screens and their job is to protect the nozzles themselves your oil is going to come through here and it's going to lubricate your gears what these filters do they're known as jet protection screens they're also known as last chance filters but what they will do is block 50 percent anything 50 percent of the size of the nozzle from getting through there 
therefore protecting the nozzles so they can't get blocked. Because that's what happened. The Mannheim bird, besides a bunch of other failures, those nozzles became clogged. The forward transmission wasn't being lubricated. By the time they got the light headed towards the ground, forward transmission seized. Aft transmission continued to turn. Aft rotor blades hit forward rotor blades, and down came the aircraft. It happened at such a low altitude that the jumpers on board couldn't get out. So it went down with all people on board. Now we're going to look at the airflow. As we look at the airflow, keeping in mind, what is the importance of the airflow on this aircraft? The importance of the airflow on this aircraft is that we manage airflow, which means what? Which means that airflow it's going to come in from the forward pylon right here. In this first little area, what's going to use it first? Your hydraulic cooling system. Number one flight control hydraulic cooling system. And then you notice that air is going to pop up and be blown into the forward transmission area. Which means what? Which means that that fan inside of here actually is not a fan, it's an impeller. Meaning what? It's actually sucking air through a duct system or a shroud in, and now it's blowing that cool air through that cooler. This is the only one that blows through. All the rest are ram air or sucked in. Okay? Any questions about that? Combining transmission has three coolers. Why three coolers? There's your cooling fan, number two engine transmission, number one engine transmission, and your combining transmission. Aft transmission has a fan back here. There's the fan, there's the cooler, keeping in mind that all the transmissions are self-contained. Now what's going to happen is the airflow is going to be ram air through the front of the Half pylon. Why? Because that's the way it was created. Combining transmission is going to use what it needs and take the exhaust and blow it up to the top of the aft pylon. The rest of the airflow is going to go into the hydraulic compartment where the number one and number two, excuse me, utility and number two flight control hydraulics is going to use what it needs. The rest of the air is going to go around the aft vertical shaft and then down through and around the aft transmission where that drip pan and those doors keep that airflow trapped in there. Aft transmission is going to use what it needs and then through a series of ducts it's going to blow it out the aft pylon. Rotor wash is going to catch it and then take it back up to the fuselage. Which is why if we have a stinky ranger in the back, you're smelling it too. Somebody takes a dump in their pants, you're smelling it up front. Somebody loses their cookies, you're smelling it up front. Why? because that's the way the airflow is made to travel in this aircraft, which is why it's important. Close those pilot and co-pilot windows, push those air control knobs in. It slows it down, but it will not stop it. Okay, which is why we have smoke and fume eliminations next. Any questions about that? Okay. Oil pressure indicator. The only cooler really that sucks there is the combined Forward transmission. Nope, ram air is the combining transmission. Forward transmission sucks air through it and blows it through. All the rest are either ram air or that airflow is being sucked through the cooler. Which is why what? You'll find the grass adhering to the combining transmission and the aft transmission, but you'll never see anything adhering to the forward because the airflow is blowing through that one as opposed to being rammed air or sucked through. Okay, as we look at the pressure indicating system, keep in mind that what we have is a selector and the selector for the oil pressure and temperature are identical. Meaning what? Meaning they're going to have the same positions. You've got a test position and here's what I like to do. In my head, I know there's seven positions. What are they? Test, scan, forward, aft, mix, left, right. And that's going to be both selectors. One for pressure and one for temperature. Okay? What's the big deal about test? Test is a maintenance procedure. 
But what's good about it from your perspective is it sprung loaded from the test position right back to where? Scan. So no matter how that knob becomes adjusted, go to the test, release it, it'll go to the scan position automatically. For pressure, it's going to be scanning what? The lowest pressure. Why? Because when we get to temperature, it's going to be scanning for what? Highest. Now, keeping in mind, the order freaks everybody out too. Why? Because we're used to what? Forward combining and aft, but it doesn't go that way. It goes forward, aft, but then it doesn't say combining, it says what? Mix. Which is why when we talk about the combining transmission, you'll re heard it referred to as the combining transmission, C-box for short, or mixing unit. Because that's what it used to be called on its predecessors. Any questions about that? Now, the transducers, transmitters send a signal to the selector and from the selector up to the gauge based on the selector position. That makes sense, right? And again, it goes from zero to 100. Keeping in mind, we got a minimum of what? Minimum of 7 PSI, not to be confused with what other one? 5 PSI, which is engine oil. 5 PSI, which is engine oil. This is 7. These are your main transmissions, an engine transmission. And then normal range is from 20 to 90. And there's where your oil pressure transducers, transmitters are. If you can identify one pressure transmitter, you can identify them all. They all look the same. Okay. You can see the one for the aft transmission. You can see the ones for the engine transmissions and the combining transmissions. And the only one I don't have to show you is the one for the forward, but it's mounted on the bulkhead directly behind the forward transmission. Did we already talk about all that? Okay, transmission oil pressure temperatures indicators. Temperature is going to be the same thing, only we're going to be talking about what? Bulbs and probes. Bulbs and probes. Why? That's where all our signals are going to come from for the gauge. We already talked about the selector. The only difference is in the scan, it's going to be selecting what? The highest temperature. The highest temperature. Oh, keep in mind with pressure, you'll notice it didn't have an aft vertical shaft, which is why if I'm in the scan, and I have my main oil pressure light, and it's in the normal ranges, it, by default, it has to be the aft vertical shaft. Confirmed via the maintenance panel. Any questions about the temperature? What's going to be the temperature associated with this? What? Okay, but it's going to be 140 max. 140 max. Now, here we go. We're going to introduce you to a new word, and that is on your transmissions, you have a temperature bulb slash probe slash switch, meaning what? Meaning the same component is going to be giving you both your gauge and your lights. That's why the big deal. This is just the switch, but this is a bulb slash probe slash switch. So it's going to be responsible for not only your gauge indication, and you can see all the gauges, or all the bulbs, probes, but it's also going to be associated with your lights. 140 is max, period. What were you giving me? Hydraulics. Hydraulics. Okay. Transmission oil hot. Do we need to talk about this anymore? What's the temperature associated with this one? 140. 140. These? 190s. 190s. Any questions about that? Everybody make sense now? Okay. Emergency procedure for the 190s. What is the emergency procedure for the 190s? Emergency engine shutdown. Notice what we didn't do. We didn't tell you our normal is engine power required for flight. Okay? We're going to confirm it. And then what? Not? What's step two? Associated engine transmission check. 
The flight engineer is going to check it for what? For fire. And then what? And then land as soon as possible. Keeping in mind, what was the one for the 140? If engine power is required for flight, land as soon as possible. Engine power is not required for flight. Emergency engine shut down, refer to single engine. Any questions about that? Okay. Now, Chip, any questions? Oil pressure. Ox oil pressure. Maintenance panel. Now you'll notice we're whizzing through these now. Why? Because we spent so much time up front. And we did a good job of covering it. But now, here's what we're going to get into. The flows. The flows. Why is that important? Because what's going to happen is because of the flows, you're going to notice our emergency procedures. If I get an oil pressure light, I have to look for abnormal readings. Based on what? Based on why? Because of the flows. When we look at the main flow, all the main flows are going to go this way. You ready? Whether it's a sump or a reservoir, it's going to be irrelevant. It's going to go through the pump, through the filter. By the way, at 15 to 18 PSI, that button will pop. At 25 to 30, it will bypass. From there, it's going to go up through the cooler, through the jet protection screen, and it's going to spray the engine transmissions. The scavenge pump is going to bring it through the debris screen, and then through the return pump or scavenge pump and back into the reservoir. Which means now we need to talk about what? What is the difference between a debris screen and a chip detector? What is a chip detector looking for? Ferrous, Ferrous material. Meaning what? Meaning this magnet's got to be able to suck it out and bring it to it. And then we have to remind you that what's connected to this chip detector? A fuzz burn-off system, exactly. And the same thing's applicable. If it's greater than two thousandths of an inch or greater, it attempts to burn it off, can't burn it off, and it will give you a chip light up in the cockpit. Okay? Now, what's the difference? What's the debris screen? What? Okay, but not what I'm looking for. It is, but it isn't. Anything including non-ferrous Okay, so what's the deal with it? Well, it's a bigger what's the what's the word that we're looking for? The material has to be conductive. Now, their favorite question is: Will a piece of grass set this off? Okay. Yes. Why? Because here's how it's going to work. What you have is a series of positively charged wires and negatively charged wires. Okay? Now right away everybody wants to throw up the BS flag, but if you look, there's a white Teflon that prevents those wires from touching each other. Now, what happens to a blade of grass that gets sucked up into this system? It's going to go on here and what's going to happen is that blade of grass is now s saturated with oil, which now makes it conductive, which is going to cause the positive and negative to con have continuity, which is going to trip it. Fair enough? Why the one-time reset option? Because if something's really small and it causes contact between the positive and negative, it's going to trip it. But what's going to happen is we've got the one-time reset option, and by having a one-time reset option, if it went through it, then it's no harm, no foul. If it's still there, then we're going to treat it just like a chip. Notice I'm very careful. We're going to treat it just like a chip. Why? How many of these do we have? We have five systems. But keep in mind, how many does the combining transmission have by itself? Four. One for the main lubrication system, one for the aux lubrication system. So what you have on the forward tra on the combining transmission, you have two of them right here, and you have two of them right here, and they all look like this. Now what you will see for the forward and the aft transmission is they're co-located. 
Debris screens are on the return side of the house. These are on the sumps or reservoirs. Any questions about that? Okay, now watch this. Combining transmission, how many lubrication systems are we going to talk about? Two, main and box. Here we go. Main lubrication system is going to suck from the top. Through the pump, through the filter, through the cooler, through the inlet screen, spray the gears. Now watch the aux system, gentlemen. Aux system is going to suck off the bottom. Come through the aux pump, through the aux filter, and spray the gears. What didn't it do? It didn't go through the cooler, which is why even though the aux lubrication system and the main lubrication systems are completely redundant for the forwarding combining, you have to pay attention to the temperature. Any questions about that? Forward transmission, same thing. Any questions about that? But now let's watch the aft transmission. I'm going to do the aux lubrication system first on this one. It's going to suck from the bottom, go through the aux pump, through the aux filter, and it's going to spray the gear, keeping in mind it's only spraying the gears located where? Inside the transmission itself. Now watch the main lubrication system. Sucks off the top, through the filter, through the cooler. One, two, three. The transmission itself, the aft vertical shaft. Why three? Why three? How many generators do we have, sir? Two. So why three? There's a mounting pad for a third generator up there. Okay, but what does everybody else always say? Once they find out that it's three generators, what generator do they normally suck into this system? APU. APU. The APU does not have anything to do with this. There's actually a third generator pad up there. We just never needed it. It was made for special weapons and informing the task force, the special equipment, they thought that they would need the extra power. They did not. The main generators are more than big enough. Now, in looking at these, the only thing I want you to take out of these is the fact that everything for the maintenance panel, it goes to the maintenance panel and then to the light in the cockpit, meaning what? Meaning if the maintenance panel doesn't work, neither will the indications up in the cockpit. Does everybody understand that? If the maintenance panel does not work, then the lights up in the cockpit will not work, which is why we test it in looking for the four and two. Four chips and one hot. Okay? For three chips and a hot. Sorry about that. Three chips and a hot. Any questions about that? That's all you're going to pull from these pictures. Everything else we've already covered. Any questions about that? Only look at the debris. Where does the debris stop? Oh, I'm sorry, the maintenance panel. Exactly. Okay? Any questions about that? Okay, for the last three hours we've been talking about your powertrain. Are there any questions pertaining to your powertrain drivetrain? Excuse me, drivetrain. If not, have a great day.